jumping the details right now from the get-go. Terrence, what's, what are we standing behind? This is a six unit building and the location is, it's outside of downtown Denver, about five minutes. It's an area called West Colfax and there's a lot of development going on. It's actually in between two opportunity zones, which is the areas that the government is incentivizing developers to come and invest in. So all that to say, it's an area that's quickly developing and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of new projects going on. Great. All right, so Terrence, how'd you source this deal? Knock on doors, who'd you call, how'd you get this? So we did not knock on any doors. This came from a broker relationship that I've been working with for two years. They know our box really well, and they primarily only bring me deals if they know it's something that is gonna be really close. We, start, we walked this in June of this year. This is December. We walked it in June, made an offer in July, and finally we were able to get the seller to accept it in October. So it took about four or five months for us to be able to put it under contract and close just because the seller originally wanted 950, we were at 825 and we were able to finally close at 852. All right, so Terrence, you got this great six unit here in a great part of Denver. What's the game plan with it? What are you doing? So the game plan for this property is we help the tenants relocate. One of the tenants actually moved across the street. Another one went to another property that we own and we are going to demo every single unit, renovate every unit. We're gonna do something a little higher end because of the area. So just that just means a little bit more expensive tile and flooring and some more custom light fixtures. So we're gonna renovate and then we're gonna put market tenants into the property. And then we're going to sell it to an investor that just wants a turnkey rental. All right, well, let's go talk some numbers. So Terrence, how'd you fund this deal? What are the terms like? It's a great question. So. We want to go into detail on funding on this show. I think everyone always asks me, how did I fund it? How did I get the capital on every deal? So on this deal, we used private money. That just means a wealthy individual that wants to invest in the pro in real estate, but doesn't want any risk or wants less risk. And so they get the first position. So I funded it the entire purchase price. So $852,000. So 100% of it. 100% of it. So I didn't have to bring a dollar to closing, but I have to fund all of construction, which is roughly $150,000. And I pay monthly interest, roughly $5,700 a month. What percent interest is that? 8% annualized. Okay, so why'd you do that and not a, a construction loan through a bank? That's a great question. So because of my business, I wanna do 10, 12, 15 of these projects a year. I only had to bring $150,000 for this project with private money. If I use a bank, I'd probably have to bring 250 to $300,000. So I have to bring a down payment, 20 to 25%, plus I still have to fund construction. Okay. So even though it's a lower interest rate with a bank, maybe five, five and a quarter versus eight, I have to pay a closing, I have to pay closing costs, I have to pay for an appraisal. Some banks want environmental tests. So there's a lot more closing costs. And so that just doesn't make sense if I'm gonna hold it for only six to seven months gotcha. to pay all those costs. What about hard money? So hard money is normally 10 to 12. Maybe if you go with a national lender, you can get it at eight, but they're also gonna charge origination. They're gonna make you bring probably 15 to 20% down. They would fund some of the construction, but again, you have to, I mean, I would have to deploy more capital and they still wanna charge, they still want an appraisal and closing costs and those kind of things. Plus with hard money construction loans, you gotta deal with their draw process and right. their funding stuff. Great, do the work, show the receipts, get the money, go through that headache, where if you're funding your own renovations, you can, you can be faster. 100%. So I think that the the punchline for you out there is you have to really know the project, know the scope of work. If construction is going to take longer than 12 months, I think getting a bank involved makes sense. If it's going to be shorter, you should look at private money if you have the relationships, if not hard money. All right. So we can dive into a lot more details on that. Make sure you check out the other video where we talk about all that. Now let's go walk the property. Let's, talk let's check it out. All right. We're inside your first unit here. Who's our special guest? We have a very special guest today, Chris. So I've known Athena Brownson since 2004 when I first moved to Denver. We had some similar friends. Since then, she's become a realtor. She's crushing it. She just joined Compass Realty and she focuses on residential, but has been wanting to transition into investment properties. So I thought it'd be cool to have her on and I'm really excited to show her what we're doing. I wonder who that is. Hey! Imagine to see you. you. <laughs> Nice to see you. Yeah, what's going on? Good to see you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to learn a little bit more about what this project and see what you guys are up to. Yeah, we're super excited to have you. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. So what's the like the main thing you want to learn today? I am really curious to learn about your guys' punch list, what items you're looking for in each property and these multifamilies. Um, I'm starting to work with a lot more investor clients and I really need to understand your process. Athena, 
the first part of the process is understanding the layout. Okay. Layout's super important, similar to you with your clients on the buy or sell side, is if a tenant does not have a comfortable space to live and a good layout, they're not gonna wanna rent it. So even if we create like the best, best apartment with the best tile and the best flooring, if the layout isn't functional, we're not gonna be able to get maximum rents. Absolutely. So we always, so the first thing we normally do is walk through and trying to get an understanding for the layout. Perfect, let's take a look. Let's, let's take a look. So over here, when we first walked in, this was a closet. Okay. So naturally, if you were gonna live in this or myself, if anyone our age was gonna live this, we wouldn't want a closet in our living in room. In the living room. Right, yeah, that's not absolutely. like something that people really <laughs> want. It's not really let's valuable. Let's open the space So up. let's open it up. Mm -hmm. And then we try and look at, we try and imagine where is the TV gonna go? Yeah. So since we have, normally it'd be on this wall, but since there's a window, we take out the closet and we say, oh, this is a great spot for a TV. Perfect. So then we can put the couch over there and we understand that this would be kind of like a living room. So this makes sense. It's kind of open. Open floor plan. Right. Yeah, you guys did a great job. Okay, so here we are in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So this is a small kitchen. So when I'm walking through units, I'm looking at what are the size of the kitchen? What's the location of the kitchen? What size is the bathroom? How big are the bedrooms? These are all things that really matter to tenants and are going to really drive the price of the rent when we're done. Speaking of those items, how many beds and baths does each of these units have? And is each floor plan the exact same in all the units? It's a great question. So the bedroom, it's two bedroom, one bath right now. Okay. They're all two bed, one bath. A couple of units have an option for a third bedroom that's used currently as storage. Okay. So at the end of the project, we'll have four two bedroom, one bath and we'll have two, three bedrooms. Great. And when we tour the exterior, we'll be able to see the buildings across the street actually did the same thing. And that's where we were able to get that idea. Is awesome. they, they turned the storage into bedrooms and they were able to get an extra $150 in rent. And naturally that's a big deal. So we, so we will do the same thing. So how are you gonna lay out this kitchen? Because we got the plumbing here for the sink. And then, you know, what goes where, what that cabinets do you use? What, what does this cost? So great questions. So. What we've been doing this year is because because of the volume of kitchens that we'll do, we'll probably do 100 kitchens in Denver this year. We'll, we'll renovate 100 to 150 apartments. So wow. what we started doing was lower base cabinets. Mm -hmm. And then on the upper, we'll do maybe one be on each side of the of the vent for the range. Okay. And then the rest we'll do uh, shelv shelving. Okay. And we'll do black shelving, so it kind of gives it an industrial look. Yeah. It's also functional. But then every box, every brand new box of cabinets is between 100, 100 150 to 200 dollars. So if we can save three boxes expensive. here, yeah. we're saving between three and 400 dollars per kitchen, and the shelves only cost us 20 dollars. So if you extrapolate 300 dollars in savings over 100 kitchens, that's that's a lot that's of money. Huge. So yeah. that's what we started doing, and, I, and we've had good we've had a good response from the tenants. They like the aesthetic of it, and it is functional as well. That's so that's what we're so that's what the kitchen layout will look like. So this will be the all sink, cabinets, stove. Exactly. A and box up here, shelves. And the range will go here, or I mean, and the fridge will go here. Okay, and That's you need the dishwasher or, or not enough room? There won't be, there's not enough room. There won't be a dishwasher. Okay, so what's the ballpark to do this? This To do the kitchen. To do the kitchen, labor and materials will probably be around $8,000. So all in for the project, so every, uh, to do all of the pro the entire project is gonna $150,000. That includes the exterior paint, that includes the roof, landscaping, which we'll talk about when we get mm -hmm. to the outside. That includes recessed lighting, that includes air conditioning units. So normally for just the kitchen, we're trying to be under $8,000 per kitchen. So besides layout, what are the other items that you're really looking for in these properties before you acquire them? It's a great question. So just like on the residential side, you're thinking about buyers and sellers mm -hmm. and what it's gonna be like for them. On my side, all we think about is tenants. What's it gonna be like for them to live here and what's gonna make it more attractive so then they wanna pay more to live in the property that thus making the property more more attractive Absolutely. to a buyer. So one of the big things we look at is what's the heat source? Okay. In Colorado, there's big swings. And so people wanna know what's what's the heat gonna be like. So here we have a boiler system. Oh, wow. And the pros and cons to boilers is that it's more efficient. So from a landlord perspective, the landlord's gonna spend less money on gas and electric. Okay. So it's very efficient. It's probably four times more efficient than forced heat. The downside is that tenants don't like that they can't control the heat and it takes a long time to cool cool down and to heat up. Gotcha. So you can imagine if it's 80 degrees and then it drops 40 degrees overnight, which happens in Colorado, tenants get really upset. And when tenants get upset, we get a lot of phone calls. Gotcha. We don't want a lot of phone calls. Mm -mm. So this is one of the things we really look at. If a boiler is older than 15 years, we normally replace it. 
So one of the things we've seen is when we replace boilers, we put in forced, forced air furnaces. Okay. We're able to do heat and AC. When we add that, we're normally seeing between $75 and $150 more a month we can charge because that's what tenants want. Gotcha. So this property in particular has a boiler, um, but in other properties, you're looking to replace that with forced air. Exactly. So the property we'll go to next, you can see we replaced all the forced air. We're going with a Nest thermostat system. We're going to be able to charge a lot more. But this is a boiler that's actually recently replaced, so we're gonna keep it. But it's just one of the things we have to keep in mind when we're underwriting it to understand what the rents are gonna be. Rents are gonna be a little bit less when it's a boiler just because tenants would prefer to have forced heat. Gotcha. So Thanks. it's really important to take note of. So with these two bed, one bath units or three bed, one bath units, um, what are you doing to the bathrooms to make them the most appealing to your tenants? That's a great question. So again, I'm putting myself in the, in the perspective of the tenant. And so if it's a two bedroom or a three bedroom, most likely they're gonna have children or a significant other. Yeah. So if it was a one bedroom or a studio, we would just do a stand up shower gotcha. and give them a bigger vanity, more storage space. Because it's two bedroom and three bedroom, it's probably gonna be two or three or four people living in the unit. So we do, we will have a tub. Awesome. So we do a porcelain tub and then we'll do 12 by 24 tile all the way up to the ceiling. And then we'll do the same tile on the floor. Okay. So we'll do 12 by 24 tile, just. Little, adds a little bit of a pop, it's more modern. And then we will do a custom new vanity with a mirror, a light fixture, and then we'll just paint it all white. Yeah. So pretty simple, but it will have a little bit of a pop just because of the tile and it'll all be brand new. And I love that it has natural light as well. That's huge. Yeah, it has a natural light. It's pretty good size. Some of the bathrooms in Denver, because just the way construction used to be done, yeah. you can't even like close the door, the toilet like bangs the door. So this is good size, Great the toilet's size. gonna fit. People, you know, you can have two people here at a time if you had to, you know, cause you're gonna have a family. Yeah. Uh, you could have a family here. So this, you know, we look at size and we look at what's with the location, what is the tenant Who gonna look like? Tenant? Yeah, is it gonna be a young professional? Is it they're gonna have a family? Most likely here, it'll be a family, a married couple, younger children, Gotta have the like bathtub, that. definitely. Right. Gotta have the bathtub. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Cool. Guys, while you're in the bathroom, I got some bad news. It is raining out there, we're getting a little snow, so I think the exterior checklist we have, we will skip that today. Just so you guys know, we have an interior checklist, an exterior checklist. Check the show notes, get the details. Future, future episodes with a lot more details on there. Um, but we gotta round out, man. We yeah. appreciate you coming out here. Yeah, thank you so much for <laughs> having me. And That's so, so everyone can connect with you. How can they find you in bigger pockets? bigger pockets so i just realized that i haven't signed up yet i'm a total amateur you guys are gonna have to show me the rope so <laughs> while we were filming the show it came out that athena doesn't have a bigger pockets profile and if you want to do deals with investors you have to get on bigger pockets i'm really excited i feel like it's gonna open up so many different possibilities so why don't we go grab coffee and you can show me how to sign up yeah let's skip the checklist outside let's go get you on bigger pockets okay, it's more perfect. important let's go. way more fun <laughs> Hey everyone, Terrence and I are back in the studio. We're gonna dive in the financials on that six unit apartment building that we just walked here in Denver. So jumping into it, Terrence, uh, you bought for $852,000, right? That is correct. And how'd you get a 0% down payment? So we went with private money at 8%. So basically they funded the entire purchase price, but it was at 8% interest paid monthly and they have a deed of trust on the property. Okay, so you uh, had zero closing cost. So you brought zero money to the table and you wrapped all the closing costs into the loan at 8%, right? That's correct. Yeah, now that's pretty stellar to do. So, and you expect your development cost to be about $160,000, right? Yeah, we budgeted 140, but then we had a 10% contingency. So 160 is a round number that we came up with. Is that your normal? normal? Uh... Yeah, we always try and put a 10% contingency. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. So you think it's about 140, but does it normally creep up the extra 10%? Yeah, things happen just unexpected things, drywall doesn't get done correctly or tile you have to come in and redo or the boiler goes out mid project. I don't know. There's a hundred things that go on in a project. So contingency is key. All right. So let's talk about uh, how it looks while you're developing the property, because this is a six unit and you can, uh, you vacate the whole building on this one, but sometimes you also have some tenants in place while you're renovating the units. Yes, on this property, there was only two tenants and they wanted to leave just because there was a bunch of issues with it. And so we did uh, this building we cleared. Most buildings we try and we try and do it in different turns, in sections, so that way we have some income while we're renovating the property. But you can see here on the screen that basically rent 
and rubs, which is the utility bill back system, it's at zero, zero every month. So there's no income coming in on here. So your expenses, your uh, 8% interest rate is costing you $5,680 a month. Utilities about $640 a month. Taxes just under $300 for the year. Your insurance is right around $340 a month. Uh, so that brings your monthly total to just under $7,000. And that means while you're what, you got nothing or you got no tenants in there, it's costing you about $7,000 a month. That's right. That's painful. Yeah. And so how do you budget for that? Is it just uh, because, I mean, this is money that you're paying out every month. So that's just coming out of like your reserve account, right? Or your yeah, operating account? So that's account? on top of construction. Okay. So that's how we underwrite it is, you know, how many months is it going to be? Because it was vacant, we could do construction a little bit faster, but there's no income. So, so then speed becomes really important. And obviously the faster we can rent it up and we can start getting some income, the better. But yeah, $28,000 is painful on top of construction. Now, I'm assuming, you, I know you do your financial models when you do that. Uh, how much extra do you have on contingency for this? Or do you even worry about that? Yeah, construction goes late a month, but on because we're using the same crews we've always used, it, you know, maybe it goes late two weeks, but you know, we, we could underwrite an extra month in there. So an extra $7,000 still puts us at 35, but in with, as you'll see in the projects of this size, you know, an extra seven to $20,000 doesn't really make a big difference at the end of the day. All right, so let's look at uh, once it's stabilized. So this is once it's fully renovated, you got it rented out, you got market tenants in there, or hopefully above market tenants in there for rent wise. So the total gross annual rents $105,000 a year. And this was two, three bedrooms and four, two bedrooms? Yeah, good memory, exactly, yeah. yeah. Four twos and two threes. Okay, and so all together adds up to $105,000. And then talk about the uh, rubs, like how are you building that back and what are you giving the tenants for that $100 each per unit? Yeah, so on this property, electric was separately metered, but gas was not. So gas, water, sewer, and trash are included in $100. So basically that's just billed every month on top of the rent. And that just goes to cover those utilities. And really that's just meant to offset your actual expenses, and, uh, yeah, we right? Yeah, you cannot make money on it. It's a, it's a, it's a federal law. Um, so it just goes to offset those expenses. Most of the time we're paying more than that, but $100 is a pretty round, fair number. It gets pretty close. Sometimes in some properties, depending on the area and the way the plumbing's configured, it could be 110, 120 per unit, but you know, $100 is pretty safe. Yeah, and that's what I mean, most multis in Denver, they're right around usually $75, dollars $125 a month in rubs. That's right. So 5% vacancy. And so this is for when units are not vacant or you have tenants not paying your money, your credit loss because you're not, you don't have a tenant in every room or every unit every day of the year. That's right. So uh, most people underwrite right around 5% here in Denver. That's a really good rule of thumb for a multi-unit. So about 50 to 50 a year in vacancy. So you take the rents, add your rubs, subtract your vacancy. It gives you an effective gross income, just around $108,000. So that's before you have really any real expenses because vacancy is not a real expense, that just happens. So take your $108,000 and we'll subtract out, and these are all annual numbers. The annual taxes on here are $5,360. Insurance is about $3,000 a year. Utilities, $7,800. And as you pointed out, Terrence, you know, we're saying that's the exact same amount that you're bringing in rubs on here. That's right. Uh, because it's just gonna offset. Now it's gonna probably be a couple bucks one way or the other, but it's not a big deal. Uh, repairs and maintenance, underwriting about $4,800 for the year. Uh, I forget the exact amount, but that's what? 400? 50 a month, I think, per unit. Yeah. I think under a little higher because we're doing the uh, Freddie Mac loan oh, on okay. here. Okay. And they got the more strict underlying requirements. Uh, property management, uh, 6%. Uh, so about $6,500 a year. And when you underwrite these actually, Terrence, for property management, I know that's like the monthly fee. Do you worry about like the lease up fees in there? Or how do you account for that? You definitely can. Um, since we're going to be leasing it up, we kind of take care of that internally. But yeah, normally in Denver, you're seeing about half of the first month's rent as an expense. And and I think the better property manager you get, you could be go up a little bit more than that. So you could you could definitely add that. We don't, you know, when we're going to sell it. Normally that's not underwritten. But if you're gonna, if I was going to hold this, I would definitely factor that into my long term expense every every year. Having to turn over units and release is definitely an expense you want to account for. And that's for for me. I like to keep it simple stupid rule where that's where like for vacancy, you can underwrite like 3% realistically. I like to mm -hmm. round up to 5% because like, cool, that take, you know, a couple percentage points for turnover fees. For the lease up, yeah. yeah. So your office expense, you know, $900 a year for payroll, paperwork, legal stuff. Uh, 
two about two thousand dollars a year for snow removal, uh, standard lawn uh, care, lawn care, and that place would be pretty much zero scaped, right? Yeah, we try and zero scape everything. You just don't want to have to do irrigation in Denver because it's so dry. But for snow, you know, depending on the years, a lot of snow and anything, you know, tr extra trash, you know, just two thousand dollars is a comfortable number. And you have a pretty big parking lot out front there, right? Yeah, there's I mean, a nice parking. I think it's two spots per unit. Yeah, I mean, so that's a, a twelve spot parking that's right. lot there. So that's gonna jack up your snow removal. Uh, replacement reserves. This is just putting away money for like replacing the boiler, roof, mm -hmm. just that capital expenditure stuff. So about two fifty a unit per year is the standard rule of thumb here in Denver. So all together, your annual expenses will be just under thirty two thousand dollars. So looking at this now, we're going to get it from two ways. One, so once Terrence has developed it, stabilized it, got his tenants in there, he has still got his private money at eight percent. Now that's usually, you know, an interest only loan at 8%, it's not the way to hold onto a property in the long term. That's right. But for redeveloping and stuff, it's perfect. So regardless of whether he is holding it on the back end, getting ready to sell it, or an investor is gonna come in and buy it, they're gonna have basically the same net operating income or NOI, which is your rents minus all your expenses, except mortgage debt. So your NOI on here is uh, just under $76,000 which puts you at a 29.5% operating expense ratio. And I mean, from all the multis I see in Denver, I mean, for the, you know, the five units and above, they're all right in that like, uh, you know, high 20s to low 30%. I mean, this is smack right in the norm for Denver. Right. Yeah, I, normally we're seeing 30%. So this is pretty, pretty close to the mean. And I like this because a lot of times you see 30% and they are properties that were rehabbed, you know, 30 years ago. That's and right. your properties rehabbed like 30 days ago. So when I see that type of number for your quality of property, it gets me even more excited. So uh, looking at the, the cash flow, and this is while Terrence is holding it from a monthly standpoint, you take the NOI, divide by 12, we're about $6,300 a month. His 8% monthly interest payment is about $5,700 uh, $5, a month. So he's netting about six fifty dollars a month. So, I mean, you're not going to Vegas on that or buying the <laughs> property. But I mean, while you're holding the property and taking care of the final details and selling it, like you're not bleeding money. That's right. And it's a lot cheaper than refinancing all the fees and closing costs that go into refinancing. So to, to be cash flow positive and still be holding 8% debt is, is, a, is a good situation to be in. And I always liked, because I know you started out flipping single family homes. Hey, once you have a single family home flipped, your cash flow is negative. Oh, Because yeah. there's no tenant in there. It's very painful. Yeah. That's right. So this makes the uh, getting into market and selling it a lot less painful. All right, so now you know there, there's really two investors to these scenarios here. There's there's what Terrence is doing as the operator to go on there, find a undervalued, undermanaged asset, rehabbing it, bringing it up to market rent, putting a good management in there, and then turn around and sell it to an investor that does not want to do what Terrence does, but just hey, they got more money, they want to invest it, and they want to park it. That's right. So the way uh, multi units trade is on. Uh, cap rates, which are capitalization rates. So, you know, quick refresher, that is your net operating income divided by the purchase price. And that's how basically all five units above trade, as far as I know, in Denver and really around the country. And so in that part of town, I mean, we were saying what, like five and a quarter to five and a half cap rate? Yeah, this part of Denver, West Colfax is developing. So I think you could see anything yeah, from five to five and a half, depending on the age, the location. Uh, and yeah, the tenant, uh, the tenant and the unit mix. Yeah. So we're just gonna run three scenarios to give you a ballpark for what it looks like as far as like Terrence exiting out and comparing it. So what we did here is we took the net operating income divided by the cap rate to give us the sales price. Um, so at the lower cap rate of five and a quarter, it's about 1.44 million, then 1.38 million, and then 1.32 million. So I mean, 1.3 to 1.4 million is yeah. what you Yeah, and just expect. to give the audience some perspective. So as you go to the, towards the Midwest, cap rates get higher, which means you can get more, you can get more bang for your buck. So for instance, in Des Moines, when we're selling properties right now, we're selling them at an eight or nine or 10% cap rate. That means that's the, that's the annual yield that that property will produce. And as you get towards the coast, so New York, you know, on the East Coast, then on the West Coast, LA, San Diego, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, you're seeing two or 3% cap rates. So that's a lot of people like Denver because you can still get a cap rate that's better than being in a treasury bond or in a government bond, but it's less risky than being in, in a Midwest city that during a recession could have a lot more vacancy and a lot more issues. 
I totally agree. And so selling cost on here, I mean, about 6% for selling cost for listing agent, buyer agent, normal stuff. So 6% of sales price, all right around $80,000. Now here's where it's all the same. No matter what you sell it for, you still paid $852,000 for it. You still spent about $160,000 in development cost, and you still had about $26,000 in carrying cost. So the profit, uh, estimated profit at five and a quarter cap rate, is about $320,000. Five and a half cap rate, about $260,000. At the higher cap rate of five and three quarters, you'll be closer to $204,000. Now, I know you're uh, you know, getting ready to finish this project. Like, where do you, what's your gut tell you? What do you think on the sales price? Yeah, so actually uh, two weeks ago, a neighbor that owns several buildings in the same neighborhood contacted me and was willing to offer close to 1.38 and that was net of commissions. He was a broker himself. So it seems like, you know, if we were gonna list it, we'd probably list it somewhere north of 1.4. So probably in between five and a quarter and five and a half. And the building next to us actually just sold at over 200 a door and it was unrenovated and the rents were, I think on average $200 less a month. So I think, you know, based on the market, interest rates are really low. The economy's, you know, relatively booming and people are pretty um, buying multifamily in Denver pretty aggressively. So we could probably try and push that five and a quarter, which is really aggressive. Uh, back in the day, Denver was trading closer to seven. So just as Denver continues to grow and it has kind of a better reputation with national investors, you're gonna see cap rates in Denver probably continue to compress. Mm -hmm. So whereas in a couple of years, we'll probably be looking back and saying, man, we used to sell this at five and a quarter. Now we're selling at four and a half, you know, something like that. Yep. And so for you, how do you balance like, hey, that sounds like it's a pretty, easy transaction. Mm -hmm. How's that way into you want to exit out of the property? Yeah, like, for us, you know, these, you know, when I, we own some other properties that are larger and normally if, it, if the building's over 40 or 50 units, it's something I'll consider holding long term just because you have more economies of scale with property management and maintenance and marketing. And it just is easier to manage. You know, if I was going to have 20 of these around town and they're all four to six units, you know, we have one vacancy and all of a sudden, you know, we have, you know, it's just the cash flow and then manage, managing and leasing these kind of buildings and handling uh, the maintenance and the turnover just becomes really cumbersome if you're going to try and have hundreds and hundreds of units, which is kind of the game that we're in. So normally when we have smaller buildings like this around town, we sell larger buildings we tend to hold. All right. And so we're going to run through a scenario on what it looks like for the other side of the coin. And this is where it's like based, I think in my mind, a win-win situation. It's a win for Terrence. It's a win for the investor buying the property. Hopefully the that gentleman that approached you. Uh, so we're going to uh, assume middle of the road, five and a half cap rate, which is right around that 1.38 million purchase price that I think right. you got floated by. Right. Uh, good coincidence there. Uh, so normally on these types of properties, they require a 25% down payment. So that's going to be $345,000. Now this is the end buyer coming in with a 25% down payment. You know, and we underwrote this with a uh, a Freddie Mac loan that my friend was at CBRE Lending. And so all the loan fees were about $24,000. Acquisition cost, inspections, all the title costs, maybe about five grand on there. So altogether, this investor will be in it for about $375,000 to buy this property. And that's down payment, plus just all the transactional fees you have to do with real estate. So, uh, you know, the way this was underwritten by our loan officer, you can get a five-year fixed with a first year of interest-only payment for five years at 3.83%. Those interest-only payments the first year is about $38,600. And then the second year, once he stops paying interest and principal, it'll be about $58,000 a year. So this was a, a Freddie Mac small balance loan non-recourse, meaning that if the property defaults the payments, they can't go after the owner. And that's why a lot of times people like to use non-recourse loans because they're not personally guaranteeing it. So big thank you to Craig Branton at CBRE for running the numbers for us. And this is a great visual guide we like to use that one of our friends uh, created called the Return on Investment Quadrant. Um, so it kind of shows you the four ways to make money in real estate. And that way it gives you a great visualization because a lot of people just look at cash flow, but cash flow is just one of four ways you make money. So in that first year, should be about $37,000 in cash flow, and about a 9.9% .9 cash on cash return. Appreciation, we're assuming a 3% appreciation rate here, make about $41,000 in appreciation, or an 11% return on that initial investment. That pay down is zero that first year. 
Why? Interest only payment. So that actually makes the debt pay down goes to zero, but makes the cash on cash return, the cash flow, a higher rate. Now, the second year, you'll start getting some debt pay down because that is your tenants paying down your debts for you. And then you get your depreciation tax benefits, which is an amazing benefit you get from real estate. And this should be about $4,500 a year, just with some very normal assumptions on here. So all together, the investor putting $375,000 down should make about a, a total of a 22.2% return on that money. And, and what's interesting is with multifamily, when you talk about appreciation, what we're talking about is just the rent increase. So normally, conservatively, we're talking about 2 to 3% increase a year. Now, on a single family home, appreciation is what the homes around it are trading for and selling for. But in multifamily income producing properties, whenever you see appreciation, it's we're talking about rent growth year mm -hmm. over year. So uh, wrapping up here, hey, what's it look like in five years? Because, you know, normally people don't come buy a property, buy it for one year, then sell it, unless they're doing what you're doing where they're redeveloping it. So in about the fifth year, we're modeling should be about, you know, 30,000 and change in cash flow. That's rents minus operating expenses, minus mortgage debt. And we're doing some uh, normal assumptions for rent and expense increases. The cumulative cash flow should be at $144,000 for this total of five years. And a total equity, and this includes his down payment, plus debt pay down, plus, uh, you know, appreciation, it's about $686,000. Now, Terrence, you see these numbers like this, what's your, what's your reaction to this stuff? I think, you know, what's interesting about real estate is just the compounding effect of rent growth year over year, uh, paying down debt, uh, you got depreciation, and you have rent growth, you know, so I think those things compounded fi over five years, you see, just get to be astronomical numbers for just like, a normal working class family or an investor, you know? So those are massive numbers. Um, in five years, most Americans don't make $700,000. No, like, and that's just the power of like, hey, because a lot of people, oh, well, it's only a five and a half cap rate I hear at right. times because they're comparing it to a Midwest or other right. things. But like, if you put in the big picture, you still get a very impressive return and you can realistically make a 20% plus return in money the first year. And this is one of the reasons why multifamily is so hot right now. You hear so many people talking about syndicating and, you know, all these different strategies to get into multifamily. And this is this is one of the reasons why when debt is as low as it is and you're still buying cap rates that are in the mid fives, the spread there, you know, and we can talk about this more later, but when you're buying, you know, you get debt for under 4% and cap rate is over five, you have over 150 basis points. And that is, that's where the margin is for someone to make money. And so whenever you have over 100 basis points, normally people are flocking to that. So just when it comes to commercial real estate, I think multifamily has been hard to beat because of these, because of the, uh, the, uh, the effect of these numbers. Totally agree. All right, guys. Well, that wraps up this video. We would love to hear from you on what you thought about the walkthrough, the financials. We want to do a deeper than normal dive in the financials. We know we threw a lot at you. So hit us up on Bigger Pockets. You can go at, at Terrence Doyle for Terrence or at CH Lopez for me. Our links will be in the show notes. We love talking about this stuff. That's what we do like nine days a week. <laughs> and if you live in Denver or in Denver for a weekend, we're gonna be bringing on a lot more guests for the show. So definitely hit us up if you wanna be a guest on the show. Terrence, final thoughts? That was great. Nice work. Cool. Thanks everyone.